complexity is everywhere. Instead of avoiding challenges or fearing failure, I've learned that you have to focus on what you can control. In work and in life, when that noise and chaos try to creep in, I choose to stay true to myself and remember who I love. That's how I control complexity. We are back with Hacker Valley Red, where we're exploring the nexus of offensive cybersecurity and humanity with a hacker's mindset. Again, I'm one of your hosts. I'm Chris Cochran. And I'm Ron Eddings. And we are going to continue this journey of speaking to cybersecurity legends from the offensive side of the house. We're thinking pen testers, bug bounty hunters, and also offensive operators. One of the things that people, when it comes to mind when you talk about hackers or even just cybersecurity in general, you always think of like the black hat hacker that started hacking when they were a kid and they get in trouble and they either they go to the government or they become a consultant. And that's actually few and far between. There aren't a lot of folks in cybersecurity did today that have that particular trajectory. But we have to get right to this episode because the guest for today did that route. Really understanding his origin story is going to be incredible. It was incredible to listen to, but we are talking today to Tommy DeVos, also called uh, Doggy G. And he is a hacker's hacker, starting from a kid, got into a little bit of trouble, and then went on to do incredible things in bug bounty and hacking in general. But without further ado, let's jump right to it. What's going on, everybody? You're in the Hacker Valley studio with your hosts, Ron and Chris. Yes, sir. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. We are joined with a legend in the making, someone that has been doing big things in the offensive side of the house, offensive operations, red teaming. We have the million dollar hacker, also known as Tommy DeVos also known as Doggy G. <laughs> he is a bug bounty expert, but also a security engineer at Braze. And Tommy, we're so excited to speak to you, especially with all the great work that you've been doing in the field. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to talking with you all as well. Absolutely. We've been looking forward to talking to you for a while now. We heard you won a big competition in 2020. And ever since we we're like, we got to get this guy on the show. But for the folks out there that don't know who you are just yet, would love to hear a little bit about your background and what you're doing today. Sure. Uh, so my background started, um, I started getting interested in cybersecurity and hacking and stuff back in the early to mid nineties. Um, started out on IRC, uh, my first interactions with hackers initially was people using booters and stuff like that to kick me offline. And then one day, uh, I was trying to join new chat rooms, find new chat rooms on IRC. And I, uh, ended up accidentally joining the wrong room. And, uh, when I joined the room, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with IRC, but uh, mm -hmm. you have things called operators. And uh, when I went to this room, there were hundreds of operators in this room. And each one of them was named the same thing, but it had like a, a slightly different string on the end of it. Right. And uh, come to find out, it was uh, egg drop bots that were running on a different U.S. university computer like uh, network just about every single one in the country. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So... Uh, I kept joining the chat room because anytime I was in there, there was nobody ever talking. Uh, I was still in like, what was it, elementary or middle school, something like that. So I was having to go to bed early, of course. My parents <laughs> wouldn't let me stay up at all hours of the night. And uh, the person that owned the room it was actually from uh, San Jose, California. So mm -hmm. the time difference between the East Coast and the West Coast and everything made it so I didn't see anybody online most of the time. And I was still on a dial-up connection. This was before cable modems, DSLs, or anything like that. So it was only dial-ups. So I couldn't like stay connected all night and then like go back and see when people were talking and everything. So I just literally would join this chat room every single day. And after a couple of weeks, um, I think it was on a weekend, I actually joined and people were actually in there talking. So I started to bug them. Like I thought they were cool as hell and I wanted to learn what they were doing and at first, they were just like, who the hell is this kid? And they kept banning me from the room. But the good thing about being on a dial-up, I could disconnect, reconnect, get a new IP address, and go back in, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, after doing that for, I don't remember if it was a couple of weeks or a couple of months, the guy that owned the room, his name is Lewis. He finally was like, okay, go on the internet, read everything there is about hacking. And when you're done, come back and tell me. I didn't know it at the time, but it was like a test. And uh, he was looking for me to come back within like a couple hours or a day or so and be like, okay, I'm done. I read everything there is about hacking. So now what? And that's not what happened. I spent a few days reading everything that I could find. And instead of coming back to him and saying, hey, I was done, I came back and I was actually asking questions like, can you explain Mm. this? Can you explain that? How do you do this? And things like that. And he saw that I was like actually interested in this. And I wasn't one of the people that was just like expecting it to be handed to me and everything like that, you know. So slowly he decided to start teaching me some stuff. He gave me my first shell account. Uh, I remember that shell account ended up getting ripped from me. Um, and we had a bunch on Fnet. We had some uh, shell channels and uh, people would go in there and we would ch- trade routes or uh, boxes that had been rooted. We would trade accounts on them and everything. And it was never a good idea to go first unless you were trading with somebody that really was trustworthy and well known. Right. I didn't mm-hmm. know this. And I went to trade with somebody and they ripped me and the when I was told by somebody else, when my shell stopped working, they were like, Oh, you got ripped. Your shell got ripped. Mm-hmm. Like I freaked out. I didn't know what that meant. Like I thought they had like physically broken my shell or something like that. Right. You know? And I was like, well, can you help me fix it? And they were like, there is no fixing it and everything like that. Um, it got to the point where uh, I think it was around 96 or so. I started actually trying to, get my own shells breaking into computer systems and everything. Uh, I originally would start targeting Unix systems. And uh, back in the day, the the number one rule was being a hacker was don't hack from your own internet connection, you know, Absolutely at least, right. at least computer systems in your own country. So I would scan the uh, Korean and Japanese IP ranges uh, from my own system. And I would try and hack those and I would use those as jump boxes. Um, that was one of the first things that Lewis had taught me and stuff like that. He was like, you find a country that you don't have to worry about them coming to get you. You hack those and then you use those to hack U.S. companies and stuff like that. So just started doing that. Started building botnets, um, joined IRC takeover channels, uh, takeover groups. And we just started well, going to IRC war with uh, there were groups called TNT and Glitch back on F9 back in uh the mid late nineties. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a guy named mafia boy that, uh, hit the news a lot in 2000 because he was DDoSing the, uh, he was doing the first major DDoS of e-commerce platforms, uh, Amazon and things like that. And he was actually a rival member of, uh, uh, a different channel takeover group. And, uh, when he hit the news and we saw how much power was on it, on his botnet and everything, the damage he was able to do, it made a lot more sense on why he was able to kill our connection so uh, so easily and frequently when we were going after the same chat rooms and stuff. So uh, mm. uh, back in, I think it was like 1998, I decided, uh, I saw people were doing the defacement stuff. Uh, right. Back then, the main defacement mirror was attrition.org. Um, I ended up coming across that website and seeing where people were defacing the websites and getting them mirrored. So I was like, eh, that's pretty cool. So I started doing the same thing and then it just kind of snowballed from there. And then I ended up transitioning away from the IRC takeover stuff as much as I was preferring to go and do the defacement and building the botnets and things like that. I was never out to uh, steal identities or anything like that. You know, I was just doing it out of boredom and, Right. Because they said they said we couldn't do it, and uh, I did that for well, a little over a decade. U.S. government got mad at me a few times, came to visit me in a yeah. not so friendly way. Uh, in two thousand two thousand and two, uh, I went to federal prison in January of two thousand four for the stuff that I had done. Um, I spent just right at two years the first time. Came home again in January of 06. I was banned from touching the computers from when they first came after me in 2000. Mm. They had banned mm. me indefinitely from touching a computer. So um, when I came home on probation the first time, they upheld that and I still wasn't allowed to touch computers as part of my uh, probation. Uh, for the first month or so, I didn't get on a computer when I came home from prison. 
but then it didn't take long before I got bored and I started to like, uh, at the time I came home and, uh, I was staying at my mom's house still because, uh, when you get released from federal prison, you have to, when you're on, uh, probation and, uh, house arrest, you have to be yeah. released to a family member that will in theory tell on you if you break the rules and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, uh, staying there and I would wait until my mom and then would go to bed and then I would sneak into her office and get on her computer a little bit and at nighttime and I started out doing it for like an hour or two and then it got to the point where I would stay on until like six o'clock in the morning right before everybody was going to wake up in the house so they wouldn't catch me and then after doing that for a couple weeks it just got to the point where I didn't want to hide it anymore and Mm. uh I started doing the hacking stuff again. I did it under a different alias, thinking that I was smarter this time and that they wouldn't catch me this time. I didn't trust people as much as I did previously because that's what had gotten me arrested. Uh, my co-defendant stolen on me. Um, mm. And it lasted for about 14 months. Uh, and then in uh, March, March or April of 07, they paid me another visit. Uh, mm-hmm. found a computer in my house and violated me on probation and sent me back to prison for another year. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that year, came home, didn't waste no time, and I got right back on the computer again. I got an Xbox. I wasn't allowed to have an Xbox, a gaming system, really? or anything like that. I wasn't allowed to have a cell phone or none of that. Wow. But I didn't listen. Um, but when I came home from that time, I didn't start hacking again. You know, like mm-hmm. uh, They taught, to me, taught me my lesson when it came to hacking, but I was playing games on Xbox. I was playing games on my computer and stuff like that. Uh, I stayed out for about 18 months and I was three months away from uh, completing my probation and being released from probation. And uh, I get raided again by the FBI, DCIS, and a bunch of other agencies in October of 2009. Um, Come to find out, they had rented the house across the street from me for six months watching me and everybody that came in and out of my house. Um, I didn't know this until they put me in prison, but they, um, my, one of my co-defendants, one of my original co-defendants, he had gone back to doing the illegal hacking and stuff again, you know, Mm. and he was working with somebody else. And because of how close me and him were, when we ran world of hell together, they assumed that it was me and a girl that I had broken up with called the FBI and told the FBI that I was, uh, hacking again and that I was breaking into banks and stealing money and that I was doing it from my Xbox so that I could hide the traffic in the game traffic oh. and uh, cause them to launch the investigation. They spent the six months watching me and they couldn't get any evidence because I wasn't doing anything illegal except for possessing the computers and getting online and stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. So they raided me again. They gave me the maximum time that they could at the time uh, locked up and they gave me another 15, 15 months, I think it was in federal prison. And their mm. goal at that time was give me the most time that they could. So that way they had me in one place for as long as they could to build their case against me. And they were hoping that they could pressure me into just agreeing to plead guilty and everything, you know, but I kept telling them, uh, I, I wasn't doing it. And, uh, so I came home November 3rd, 2010, and I immediately started looking for a computer job. But the problem was, in 2010, 2011, there wasn't the positive publicity for hackers and stuff, you know? Right. Uh, when hackers were in the news, it was still nothing but negative publicity. So everybody automatically assumed that if you were a hacker, you were stealing credit cards, you were stealing identities and things of that nature. And it was really hard to get companies to be willing to give me give me a shot, especially I'm just coming home from prison a couple months ago. So mm-hmm. very, very few people would even... Uh, have conversations with me about these kind of jobs and stuff, you know, because I, I learned early on that it's best to be upfront and honest with people about my past. In June of 2013, I actually got lucky and there was a small startup here in Richmond called Global Works or uh, Synergy. They changed their name and everything, but they did, uh, they helped, uh, or help companies like, uh, grocery stores and things like that track, um, out of stock items on their shelves and stuff. And using their software, they were able to cut restock times down from like three days to like 12 hours or something like that. Well, the, um, CTO of this company ended up being a friend of my mom's And uh, they had talked about me occasionally over the last like 10 or 15 years. He was up to date on everything that I had gone through and stuff like that. And when 
he found out that the person was leaving the company, he actually hit my mom up and was like, Hey, can you put me in contact with your son? I've got uh, a, a role coming up in here at uh, my company. And I think he would be a good fit. So she made the introduction and uh, my interview was actually meeting him and the rest of the IT team at a bar here in Richmond um, on a Friday afternoon after they were done working for the day. And it was more of a, an interview to see if I was like a culture fit more so than a skill level fit. Cause he already knew uh, that I had the skills to be the system admin and stuff, you know? Um, so ended up working with them and that ended up being my first computer job. I had initially heard about bug bounties in 2014 and that's when I actually signed up for my accounts on hacker one and bug crowd and things like that, you know, but at the time, it seemed too good to be true that people were going to like let me hack into them and then they were going to pay me money. And right. the last time that I went to court in October of 20, uh, 2009, the federal judge flat out told me if I'm ever in the federal court system again for a computer related charge, he was mm-hmm. going to give me life in prison. So mm-hmm. it wasn't it wasn't worth the risk for me, you know, mm-hmm. so I didn't touch any of it. I didn't even think about bug bounties again until 2016 i was on twitter and i had ended up i was pretty active with anonymous at the time not the hacking aspect but the uh the um protesting aspect of it and everything i would do the million mask marches and the marches against monsanto and things of that nature and uh i ended up following some people that were doing the bug bounty stuff. And I started seeing a blog post about bugs people were finding and getting paid. And I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe, maybe that's something that I can look into. So I went back to hacker one and I tried to create an account. I started hacking Yahoo in the mid nineties. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I knew their systems in the nineties and early two thousands better than a lot of their system admins and stuff, you know? And, mm-hmm. um, I figure if there's any company that I should start out with, it should be them. So I started doing some hunting and doing some Googling and stuff like that, looking for servers to target and uh, ended up finding an information disclosure bug where their admins and uh, security engineers and stuff were using the GitHub gist to share diagnostic logs, core dumps and things like that back and forth when they were trying to, troubleshoot a problem and they were forgetting to either make them uh, private or delete them after they were done. So it was disclosing a ton of information. I reported that to them and they gave me my first bounty in March of 2016. And once I got that first bounty, I was hooked. It was just like, all right, I know what I'm going to do now. (laughs) So when you, you, it's almost like you're, you going through this, this classic story of being, you know, a traditional you know, black hat hacker. And then now you're, you're turning to the good side, trying to help folks out. But at this point, you're pretty much like a professional bug bounty hunter, right? You're at the top of the top. Like what was that process of going through like that initial phase, getting bit by the bug and then ultimately becoming one of the best? Well, so as I said, I got my first bounty in March of 2016. At that time, I was still with Synergy, but in order to get that job, I had agreed to start my job there for a stupid low uh, salary because I was literally wor- willing to work for almost nothing just to get my feet in the door. Yep. And I was only being paid $30,000 a year at the time to be mm. the only Unix system admin and a Java developer for this company and wasn't making much money at the time. 30,000 was a lot to me because I had never had a job that paid me that much. But, uh, After I got that first bounty, I would spend all of my free time just looking for more bugs. Then in May of 2016, the Pentagon ran their first uh, Hack the Pentagon promotion on HackerOne. Uh, I participated for the entire month. I ended up getting first place in that. And I ended up making, I want to say like, somewhere between like twenty and thirty thousand uh, dollars mm-hmm. over the course of that month. So the beginning of twenty seventeen, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna make the leap and I'm going to quit my jobs and just try and do the bug bounty stuff. So in twenty seventeen I left uh synergy either the end of twenty sixteen, the beginning of twenty seventeen, and I started doing just the bug bounties full time. Uh, my first year doing it, I made just about a hundred thousand dollars, which was 
crazy money to me at the time, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, well, I made the, the right decision because it was like at that time I was working maybe 40 or 50 hours a month and I was made, able to make that hundred thousand dollars, you know? Um, yeah. and I, I just kind of kept with it. And then in 2018, um, I changed up how I was hacking. Um, like I, my complete mythology, mythology changed, uh, methodology changed at the end of 2016, the, uh, or end of 2017 and into 2018. Um, when I first started, I started out like just about everybody else does in bug bounties. I was relying on automated tools and scanners and stuff like that. Um, yeah. like burp back to stand, yep. um, the zap scans uh arachne and things like that and it was finding bugs but nine times out of ten those bugs were duplicates because i was using the exact same things as everybody else you know so it, i i changed up and instead of relying on scans i started looking for more impactful bugs that scanners couldn't find and started doing the work manually so i started looking for ssrfs i doors uh, stored XSSs that required bypassing blacklist and things like that, that a normal web app scanner wasn't going to find because it tries like a basic XSS payload. And if that doesn't work, then it just moves on to the next thing, you know? And when I made that switch, it, it drastically changed anything. I went from making about a hundred thousand dollars in 2017 and to 2018, I made $600,000 Yes, sir. Uh, through the course of that year. Yeah. And I was still working um, about the same amount, you know, and in 2018, I set my own personal records. I hit, uh, I think there were three days in 2018 where I made over a hundred thousand dollars on each one of those days, mm, including, wow. uh, in October. Um, it was like the first week of October of 2018. Um, I had found an endpoint on Yahoo. I was hacking Yahoo almost exclusively at this point. Um, I, I had found quite a few server side request forgeries on them over the earlier parts of 2018. Well, I found a new endpoint for one of them in uh, October and the, the blacklist was pretty good, but I, I enjoy trying to bypass the blacklist used to protect an SSR. And I just started playing with it, trying to find uh, a way to bypass their blacklist at the AWS metadata server. So I wrote up that report and then I was like, you know what? I wonder how many other places on Yahoo this would work. So I started going through my reports on, on Hacker One, and every single SSRF that I had reported over the last year, I pulled each one of those up, and I tried this same trick on that, and it worked on 18 of them. So at the time, Yahoo was paying $10,000 per SSRF. So I ended up having 18 SSRFs at $10,000 each. Um, so I ended up making $180,000 for about four hours worth of work. Wow. Um, so that was ex they, extremely They never nice were like, you know what, let's just, let's just bring them in. You know, we, we're, we're well, paying them anyways. They actually, uh, we have talked several times um, about me going and working for them. But uh, at the time, it didn't really seem uh, financially like the right move for me, you know, cause right. I'm making 2018, I made 600 grand, 2019, I made 900 need thousand. So it's like, if I would have gone and worked for them in 2018, I would have significantly crushed right. my income, you know, cause yeah. it's like, if you're working for them, you can't do the book bounties for them. So my plan had been, I'm going to kind of like rock it to a wheel swallow, you know, I'm going to keep going until I don't make any more money from them. And then once that becomes the case, then I'll talk to them about maybe going to work for them or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But over, over the point uh, 2018 and 2019, I think at this point I've had single days where I've made six digit income in that single day at least six or seven times. And it's almost always been from Yahoo. So Hacker One has these live hack events pre COVID. Um, each month, Hacker One had a live hacking event in a different city somewhere in the world for four days. They would invite anywhere from 50 to 200 hackers to that city. Uh, they would pay for our flights and our hotels and everything. They would fly us in. 
Our first day would be the travel and in day. The second day would be like uh, a sightseeing day where they would kind of like give us a tour of the city and stuff. The third day was hacking day. You actually yeah. get taken to this one little spot. We're all put into a room and we spend about eight to 10 hours hacking on them and getting bounties and stuff like that. And that goes all night, you know, because once it's done, they do all the awards and everything. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's so happy because we've just made a ton of money. So we end up having a party afterwards. That's the hacker one party. And then at hacker one, after hacker one events, you always end up at a karaoke spot after the, uh, after the party and everything like that, you know? And then the last day of course is the relax day slash traveling back home day and everything, you know? So that was the, uh, that was actually the last live live hacking event that was thrown before COVID hit and everything. And I, I think on that event, I made about $130,000 for that day. But the thing about the live hacking events, uh, initially it was, uh, the very first live hacking event for Hacker One was H1702 in Las Vegas during DEF CON of 2016. Mm-hmm. And for that one, we didn't know who the targets were in advance. It was a three day event. We would get to the suite that they had uh, rented out at the MGM. And when you walked in, that's when you found out who your target was. And right. we would get a new target each of those three days. So the $130,000, I got paid it on one day, but it was over the course of about a week, week and a half of hacking leading up to the event. That So it wasn't technically all from one day of hacking, you know? I think yeah. I think many people wouldn't complain about a you know buck eighty over the course of a week and <laughs> yeah, a half. Right. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, you can't really, you can't really complain about it. Um, but that, I'm I'm glad you said that because um, I get a lot of messages and comments on my tweets and things like that of people wanting to do what I do and stuff, you know. And I I think the biggest. Uh, problem with new bug or for not with with new bug hunters but for bug bounty hunters is they see uh all of us sharing on twitter and stuff like that when we're successful and making these huge sums of money Mm -hmm. so they're they're expecting that they're going to be able to come in and do the same thing you know right and that's just not realistic and one thing that many new bug bounty hunters fail to take into account is the fact that we fail significantly more as a hacker than you're ever successful. Even the best hacker in the world fails five to 10 times more often than he's actually success. He or she is actually uh, successful in hacking whatever their target is, you know, but none of us publicize when we have those failures we only talk about when we're successful and everything. So that's all these new, these new people are seeing or people that aren't even from the industry. All they're seeing is all of these success stories and stuff. So they're wanting to get into this and they're, they're thinking that there's some like secret or special sauce or special program that we can run that helps us do this kind of stuff, you know? And I see on Twitter all the time where people have, decided that they wanted to start doing bug bounty hunting and they've quit their jobs and they're just doing this and it's been six months and they still haven't found a a single bug and everything, you know? And it's like, I don't understand how people can logically think that that was a good idea. You know, don't come into this thinking that you're going to be able to replicate my success or try to hack me or Mark Litchfield's or uh, Franz Rosen or something like that. You know, a lot of us have been doing this for a very long time. Like Mark Litchfield has been a hacker for as long as I have. He started doing this in the nineties as well, but he never took the route that I took going the blackout route first. You know, he right. started, he started on the good side. He started out as a white hat with his brother and everything, but he still has two decades of experience mm-hmm. of, hacking systems and helping secure them and stuff like that. Most of us that are the, the top earning hackers, we've got this experience from if not decades, then at least like close to 10 years, you know, now that there are exceptions to that because you've got uh, Nathaniel Wakeham. I think Nathy is uh, maybe 25 or so right now, but mm-hmm. Nathy is one of those people that uh, he, 
he doesn't, he didn't come into this expecting to be instantly successful. He understood that he had to come into this and he had to put in the effort. He had to put in the time of learning things and um, understood that when it comes to hacking, the you can never stop learning. So, Chris, you were saying for a while, we got to have Doggy G on the podcast. Yeah. We got to reach out to him. And we've been reaching out to him. And I'm so glad that you know, we had the opportunity to speak to him because this story, the story that he presented to us about his background and just how he got started in cybersecurity and hacking, it's incredible. It almost feels like this episode was a movie for me. A hundred percent, like just all the way through the start of a movie. But what's really interesting about this is with our sponsor for this season, Plex Track, there is a lot of similarities between what he was doing with Hacker One and what Plex Track does for cybersecurity practitioners. Because when he's doing his bug bounty stuff, that is scaling your cybersecurity program. You're bringing, inviting other folks to find the holes, the bugs, and then you take that information, you put it in HackerOne, and then they use that information to fix their security program. Same thing you can do with PlexTrack internal to your organization. So whether you have a red team or whether you have people that are really focused on finding the, the gaps, the holes, the vulnerabilities in your environment, then you can communicate that to the blue team so they can close out those gaps and be that much tougher of a target for folks like the old doggy G. Yes. And by the way, we would highly recommend everyone to check out Plex Track. Not only are they a sponsor, but they are also friends of Hacker Valley. And you could check them out by visiting plextrack.com forward slash Hacker Valley. That's P L E X T R A C dot com forward slash Hacker Valley. One thing we didn't mention is that this is going to be a two-parter. That's right. We are not done with Tommy. He goes on to tell so many more stories and some incredible advice for everyone out there in cybersecurity. So be sure to check out part two coming right up. See you soon.